Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you to our Ignite talk of what are the links between climate, culture, and peace. Thank you all for joining us from all around the world. So a good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Culture and heritage shape our perception of and responses to climate change and the environmental variability it is bringing. But are there any links between culture, heritage, climate, disaster resilience, peace? And if yes, what are those links? That is what we are trying to bring out with this particular session of IGNITE. IGNITE talks are a series of speedy five minute presentations that will share innovative ideas, questions, experiences, or challenges of climate change, culture, heritage, peace, and disaster resilience. These will be informal presentations of five minutes each, which will be followed by a short internal question and answer session. What we are trying to find out through this session is the human history of climate change itself. How is it that we could be better ancestors? What is our responsibility, shared responsibility of making a change and making sure that we understand the potential of culture and the influence of climate change on culture together? The full nature and scope of these connections, how they interact together are not well fully understood but major global approaches are still recognizing the influence of culture and heritage on climate action. I request before we begin to ev for everyone to please switch on their microphone, switch off their microphone, and please give our speakers and panelists their full space to present. Additionally, this particular session is available in both Arabic and French. On your Zoom screens, you will see an interpretation button where you can choose your preferred language. Let's begin by introducing our first panelist, Ms. Christine Aboud. She's an architect and urban planner and designer with a master's degree in innovation management and sustainability. She is also doing her thesis on sustainability in a post-conflict situation. And she's going to tell us all about the climate change, which is a damage multiplier in Lebanon. Ms. Aboud, please go ahead and share your screen. Thank you, Joe, and hello, everyone. Uh, I will share my screen. Climate change. Uh, is, climate change is now a certainty. The countries of the Middle East, including Lebanon, are no exception to the rule and will be impacted in decades to come by climate change. Lebanon actually is already beginning to suffer its consequences with the desertification that is spreading, the dry season that is getting longer, the rainfall pattern is changing and temperature are, using, uh, are rising significantly. Over the past few years, Lebanon has had to face immense challenges that have spared no segment of its society. The country has actually faced an economic crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, the massive explosion of the poor of Beirut, environmental damage, and a prolonged political issue. These challenges actually have paralyzed Lebanon, limited its development, and ruined its ability to cope with multiple crises. And to top it off with climate change, Lebanon faces yet another, another challenge, uh, a damage multiplier that will intensify all the current difficulties and that requires real action from the government and the population, both in the short and long terms. Lebanon's social ecological system, systems are threatened by direct and indirect dri drivers of change, uh, resource exploitation, pollution, population growth, and of course, climate change. Climate change is, is expected to increase and make water resources more limited. This will have actually a, a negative impact on agricultural production and the livelihood of many communities. But also rising temperatures will also increase demand for energy, putting pressure on businesses, but also services uh, who are struggling to meet their electricity needs. These threats affect terrestrial and marine ecosystems and impact people's quality of life and well-being. Uh, and in this way, compromising societal goals and potentially leading to a decline in the capacity of ecosystems to sustain human life. 
Lebanon has been suffering from the worst economic crisis the country has witnessed in decades. And uh, this has led to severe fuel sh shortages and worsening electricity cuts. And for this reason, uh, the level of toxic emissions in the country may have increased by approximately 300% from pre-crisis uh, levels or even more. And uh, this was the result of the increased reliance on diesel generators. Uh, Lebanon faces uh, another challenges, uh, the port explosion on August 4th and the consequences of the chronic Syrian crisis and climate uh, climate change. Climate change actually will lead to higher rates of infectious diseases, increased illness and death from rising temperature and increased malnutrition from all the reduced uh, agricultural production. This will result in more death than today and, uh, and will increase the, pre the pressure on available capacity in urban and rural health facilities. facilities. And concerning the natural resources, uh, climate change is already clearly visible with all the numerous fires happening frequently all over the country. Uh, climate change will multiply the impact of the country's actual economic crisis and all the, ch and all the challenges that Lebanon is facing and that I cited uh, earlier. And uh, it will also impede any improvement in the social and economic situation. And that's why it must be held in the heart of, of all the reforms. And to deal with all this crisis that Lebanon is going through, the government should actually include and prioritize climate change and risk management in all future reforms. Because this will accelerate Lebanon's journey towards sustainable development and strengthen the protection of the economy and ecosystem. And that's the link that exists between all these elements. So to, uh, in conclusion, actually, Le Lebanon's economy needs to recover, but it must, be in, it must be held in parallel with the action on climate change. Because in fact, the recovery plan must be a green recovery plan and sustainable at all levels. This country should consider uh, serious investments in renewable energies as they contribute to creating new job opportunities. So it's directly linked to economy, to the economy of the, of, of the country, and it will strengthen, thereby it will strengthen the economy and pre preserve the health of the, of the society. And uh, this is why the government needs to focus on citizens' health and the environment as two major pillars in, uh, in any any plan seeking to contribute to the economy to the to, to the economy's uh, recovery thank you thank you Ms. Abud, for that wonderful presentation that was quite a strong statement indeed i would now like to take this chance to introduce our next speaker mr yohei kionaga who is a conservation architect and working for the Japanese Agency for Cultural Affairs as a specialist for cultural property, focusing on architectural heritage. He's joining us all the way from Japan, and he will be talking about the coexistence between the dwelling environment and the historic architecture. Let us hear okay. what he has to say. Oh, thank you, Jill. You can you hear me? Okay. Yes, very well. Okay, so my title is Coexisting Between the Dwelling Environment and the Historic Architecture. So next, please. Okay, so in the past, cities were aiming for maximum efficiency and minimum safety. Notwithstanding, cities have been facing the absolute limits. Then the management for the growth of cities has become the most important global challenge by targeting maximum sustainability and their minimum environmental load. Next, please. But the management of historical area based on the Japanese system of the preserved district for group of traditional buildings called as PDG seems to be one of the leading approaches to the sustainable dwelling environment. Next, please. Uh -oh. The global challenge after World War II was the preservation of historical area 
UNESCO adopted the recommendation in 1976. At the same time, in Japan, the PDG was adopted with revising the law. And the next, please. The system of PDG emphasizes the respect of independency of municipalities by involving local community due to good management for the preserved districts. The important preservation district called as IPD exceeded 126 districts in 2022. It has been greatly expanding into the movement of preservation of historical area. And next, please. The IPD has variety types of historical area where wooden structures are concentrated. The largest area is about 1,200 hectares, and the smallest is about one hectare. The origin of area is also so different. For example, a merchant quarter, samurai quarter, and farming village like that. So next, please. In the 1990s, the, the establishment of a new holistic perspective for Japanese urban history introduced a new survey method. In addition, the guideline of approval for non-traditional building and new buildings have been developed. It is possible to lead creativity and diversity to the PDG. Next, please. However, the PDG are currently facing two challenges. The first one is the rapid population decline and aging in Japan. The other is the disruption of the traditional building production system due to the global integration. But the developed system of PDG is trying to overcome such modern problems. It means that the PDG gets sustainability as dwelling environment. Next, please. In addition, the new framework was appeared in 2018 called as the Regional Planning by Revising the Law in Japan. In this framework, the PDG system contributes the management for the sustainable growth of cities. Next, please. My conclusion is three topics. Number one, the management, managing the dwelling environment of Japanese cities where wooden structure concentrated deposits large amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and increases the amount of carbon dioxide absorbed by forests. The second, the contribution of a continuation of the various traditional system of the past through historic architecture is one of the sustainable approaches that prom promise the future of the preserved global environment with the minimum environmental load. The last one is it is expected that the coexisting of dwelling environment and historic architecture that image the frontier society will continue to increase. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation and a very insightful uh, case study that you have presented for us today. I would now like to invite our next speaker, Ms. Prerna Singh. She's the editor of Platform Anthropocene Incorporated, uh, which is Plantro. She held editorial positions with major Indian publications for their print and digital editions. Also, she has extensive experience in research, writing, and editing for several international platforms and NGOs. Today, from India, she's going to share with us how indigenous artists have responded to climate change. Ms. Prerna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julie. I'll just share the screen. Okay. Uh, good day, everyone. I welcome everyone uh, as uh, the editor for Platform Anthropocene, Planthro. It's a registered uh, New York-based uh, not-for-profit organization, and we aim at uh, disseminating information and knowledge uh, 
to educate and inform organizations and individuals about the intersection of human impact on the earth system. So I'll start by introducing the concept of Anthropocene. This was popularized by Nobel laureate, Professor Crutzen, who uh, conceptualized a specific time period in the history of earth that uh, describes the accelerated widespread and irreversible damage that has been done to the environment by indiscriminate human activities from the way the resources are extracted to the energy production and even consumption. So this has made us rethink our relationship with the planet. Some of the uh, possibilities that have arisen out of uh, interaction of the human action with the planet has been not just uh, confined to ecological parameters, but uh, largely a lot of uh, international uh, systems which are based on politics, based on finances, and even social inequalities have risen out of this interaction. So we uh, urge and we promote that there is a need for uh, cross-border and also uh, national, international, and local uh, governments and uh, regional and cultural centers, financial institutions, and uh, uh, government agencies to come together to brainstorm ideas and foster an approach that brings into account not just the science, but also the human side of climate change. So Planthro is a response to that. We um, curate resources from diverse academic and non-academic sources to uh, provide information by means of bibliographic references, easy to browse articles on Planthro Wiki to um, respond to this uh, complex problem of climate change to a global audience. We do not derive profits from any of our posts and largely our followers have been organic in nature. Here we try to understand the link between cultural heritage and climate change. As we have seen, climate change has resulted in forced displacement of communities, which may in the future damage peace and result in civil conflicts. So cultural heritage could actually act as a tool, not just for climate communication, but also as a tool for social cohesion, resilience for these communities who are going to adapt and rehabilitate themselves in a new setting. This map here illustrates how indigenous communities have been uh, the most vulnerable one because their livelihood is inextricably linked to areas that are high risks from tropics to Arctic. So uh, they are not just safeguarding more than 80% of global biodiversity, but they're also constituting a very small population and have had less than significant representation when it comes to climate policy and climate action. And indigenous knowledge in particular is important to us because it draws from thousands of biotic factors. And uh, this is, has been accumulated over generational interaction with the environment. So it is important that it is integrated with mainstream science to reinforce the existing climate science knowledge base. Arts has long been used as a tool to help us analyze and perceive different perspectives. So indigenous artists who have a personal connection to the places that are most vulnerable have used art as a medium to reimagine a future based on the transitions they are witnessing on ground and also share their sentiments to urge us to seek alternatives with greater awareness. On the left is the uh, art installation by renowned um, indigenous and rewarded artist who's called George Nuku. He imagines the future uh, in the year 2118 where the ocean is completely inundated with plastic. On the right is another indigenous artist, Christy Belcourt. She's made use of uh, traditional beadwork to uh, show the interconnectedness of all forms of life and water as a common thread linking it. So she highlights the need to conserve water resources. Now, um, taken from uh, indigenous uh, artist Dilip Shyam, who also masters Gond artwork uh, in India, he has used a visual metaphor, and here he makes use of a mythical snake called Sheshnag to represent Mother Earth, and he is trying to link climate change with deforestation. On the right is another image. Uh, it's a photograph taken by Nikki Cumston from uh, Australia where she highlights the fragility of this Murray, uh, 
Mure uh, Basin, which is uh, Mure Darling Basin. And she shows that how, um, on one hand, it is culturally and environmentally significant, but on the other hand, how it is on the dirts and brinks of being damaged. I would like to conclude this presentation uh, by echoing a sentiment that the ancient wisdom has shared, uh, which is, we have to try and maintain and also rekindle our spiritual connection with the environment. And in the words of Tanya Winder, who's an indigenous um, uh, poet, I would just say, we were shaped by fire made from lightning and dirt covered hands that know when to ignite healing. Now is the time. Let us not drown in Mother Earth's tears. Mother Earth has a spirit and she's asking us to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Prerna, for that beautiful presentation and for giving us strong examples of what it means to include indigenous art as a part of link uh, of culture to climate change. For our next presentation, I would like to now invite Ms. Kelly Hasiager, a dear colleague. Kelly is a Dutch Singaporean historian and a heritage and memory studies specialist currently working as a consultant for ICROM, Sustaining Digital Heritage Program. She's also currently working with us for the Climate Culture Peace Conference, and she has something to share. She's going to tell us about what I see, what I do, a nature cultural paradox. Kelly, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Julie. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, that is great. Um, okay, so hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Hasiacher, and as Julie introduced me, I'm a historian and I specialize in heritage and memory studies. Um, I am of mixed heritage, and it's funny to use the word heritage here, or a mixed race background. And I introduce myself in this way to not only position myself, but to also draw attention to the terms that we use in everyday life, and also when talking about different difficult things like climate change and heritage. And I would like today to spark a change in people's mental frameworks around nature, culture, and the almost paradoxical distinction or divide that we sometimes create between them. So my presentation is called What I See, What I Do, The Nature Culture Paradox, because I, as a historian, I argue that we are products to an extent of our society and the environment that we grew up in. And this is, includes our history and the language that we use. So the history and the language of culture and nature therefore also influences our opinions, beliefs, and worldviews. So for effective climate action, I would argue that we also have to look critically at how we think about culture and nature. So today I would like to you know, bring together this paradox of here, just some of my own images of how we create a distinction between these two of culture and heritage. So some historical and cultural examples I would like to share, they sparked for me a shift in how I thought about nature and its relationship with culture. And my understanding also grew about how this relationship is not fixed in place or time. So my first example is about the, the treatment of human waste in 18th and 19th century Japan. Um, and this uh, slide was supposed to have transitions, but this uh, captures all of my examples. Um, sorry, yes, the I can't see my notes when it's in presentation mode, unfortunately. Um, let me actually, Julie, if I quickly send it to you in the chat, then could you share it? Sure. Oops. Uh, this is, even though I do sustaining digital heritage, having technical dif difficulties, okay. So um, the first example doesn't have a picture, so I can just keep talking. So it's about the treatment of human waste in 18th and 19th century Japan. And when I was a student of history, I was very surprised to learn that late 19th century Tokyo had a pure water supply than London, which says, for example, a lot about my preconceptions. And this was studied and attributed to the the approach to night soil, which is a type of human waste and sanitation in previous centuries in Japan. And it might sound outrageous, but night soil was an economic good. So it was used, human waste was used as fertilizer and it was 
profitable to be in that business. And in Osaka, guilds even formed that were managing the rights to human waste. So this is an example, a historical example of the sustainable management of our presence on earth and learning this for me and hopefully also for others for who this example is unfamiliar can help deconstruct the assumption that over time, the management of natural human processes can only improve. Um, and that's this, you know, the idea of modernity. So another example of a type of hierarchy between culture and nature and the expression of human control over nature can also be recognized in our historical and current treatment of animals. And of course, this is a huge area of discussion, but from a historical perspective, a really interesting example is animal diplomacy or using animals as diplomatic gifts between nations. And then it's a almost stereotypical example of something that we would call natural becoming a really strong cultural and political symbol. So, and this is where these lovely pictures come in, that the platypus is, for example, it is you know, a well-known Australian animal, but it's not the stereotypical Australian animal. And that is due to historical circumstances, actually. So during the Second World War, there were multiple attempts to gift platypuses to both the United Kingdom and later to the United States but these animals did not survive the voyage well. Um, so platypus diplomacy didn't really take off. Koalas, however, did survive the voyage well and could thrive in other countries. So this is in part how koalas came to also represent Australia as a type of cuddly ambassador. And this can also be recognized with panda diplomacy and China, for example. With both pandas and koalas, these animals be, are also remained owned by their source governments, including their offspring, when the offspring is born in another country. And then, so this example that I want to further draw out is these pictures on the right side of the slide. It's to try and demonstrate that this complex relationship between culture and nature um, in this particular zoo enclosure for pandas at a zoo in the Netherlands is that these pandas are being framed by traditional Chinese architecture. The picture of the temple traditional house-like building is at this zoo. Um, however, pandas are really not a very um, traditional symbol. They were only very well known in the last century, even within uh, the Chinese population. So this is another example as from a historian and a memory and heritage specialist perspective of how culture can become a symbol of nature and nature in turn can also become a cultural symbol. So with these examples, what I'm trying and hoping to demonstrate is that the relationship between nature and culture is historical, changing, and it also influences our current treatment of nature. So part of the work of climate action, I would argue is education in this form of you know, challenging how we view the distinction between culture and nature, because it tends to prioritize human, humans in the hierarchy over the needs of our environments. And it also ignores the complex relationship people often have with nature and have on designing nature around them. So the question I would like to end with, hope to the audience and also to my fellow panel members is what mental model should we try to build of culture and nature in order to support climate action? Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And um, quite inspiring to end on a note of a question, something to keep in mind and something we shall definitely discuss at the end of our Ignite. Right now, we have one more speaker with us, Mr. David Harvey, who will be going next. He is originally from the southwest of Britain, but he has been in Denmark for over four years, where he works in the University of Aarhus. He's interested in the geographies and histories of heritage, particularly in connection with landscape, identity politics, and climate justice. Outside of university, David loves cycling and is currently struggling to learn Danish. But right now, presenting in English, he's going to talk about trying to be a good ancestor in times of climate crisis and the need for Pacific heritage. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Dewey, and uh, thanks to the other speakers. It's really, it's, uh, 
uh, I get the advantage going at the end. So I think it really reflecting on a lot to think about, a lot to think about already. And also just a note of, of thanks to the, to the really interesting introduction we had at the start of this whole week, particularly the performance from uh, M. Shoei and Mangola and uh, Babu Aching. I think it's a wonderful way to set things off. But anyway, I'd like to draw your attention as well on this first slide to these names at the bottom here. Um, you know, no matter how much we pretend otherwise, I'd say all, all research is collaborative. Uh, and uh, this, this comes, stems from the conversations I've had over the last few months and years with uh, so a lot of good colleagues out there. So, uh, so I'd sort of start things off by thinking about what I think, what I think, where is things going wrong, really? And I'd say if heritage, peace and climate change have one thing in common, is that they're all too, all too readily packaged up, commodified and essentialized, categorized for the sake of short term management and interpretation requirements. Now, heritage is usually reduced to being a stable physical thing and this, you know, an essential, an essential culture, which is somehow stable, no agency, no life, management put into place to preserve what is seen as a static physical resource decided upon by those in power, and thus politically this supports the status quo. Uh, this, is, this is always a, always a problem. Uh, to, to think about the two edges of these relationships, that one after the other, first in terms of peace and heritage relationship, I'd say peace is usually seen in terms of, in a negative sense, a state of not fighting, a, a peace as a sort of tick box target at the end of a road map or something. So you get sites such as Palmyra here on the right hand side of the screen, uh, are becoming trapped as a sort of architectural edifice without people, a proxy for culture, rather than a real place with a history and a life. It's a literal stage uh, devoid to serve a political argument upon which people, you know, groups like UNESCO and Vladimir Putin can produce a diplomatic fix, for instance. So I think heritage is a problem for peace building. It's often because heritage is often used as an excuse for conflict. But on the other side of the coin, and sometimes ignored, I feel, that heritage studies itself often has a problem with peace. Contestation and commodify, uh, sorry, contestation and conflict, I think, become commodified uh, through heritage. Basically, peace is a bit dull. Conflict is sexy. And, so, and we get stuck on that one. In terms of the other side of the, the other uh, side of the relationship in the, here in terms of heritage and climate change, this is the topic of a book that I did with Jim Perry a few years ago. Uh, the relationship is usually assumed to be one way, with heritage reduced to a physical proxy for culture, stripped of all meaning beyond numerical and locational data, particularly fixated on world heritage sites. Uh, and not very many people in the world live in world heritage sites. The concern becomes one of protecting famous ruins rather than, for instance, people living on the Bay of Bengal, which is on the book cover of the book there, who actually have to deal with sea level rise and climate change in their everyday lives. The dreams of stability, these dreams of stability, I would argue, are a form of violence, essentially founded upon a principle of maintaining the status quo of uneven power structures, coloniality and exploitation. In other words, all the things, ironically, are the, the, which are at the heart of the problem. So I'd say sustainability requires change. So we need to start somewhere else. In terms of starting somewhere else, I'd say, start by saying your heritage is an uncompleted process rather than a bounded and static thing. So therefore, stability is only relevant within certain limits. It is unachievable and it is often undesirable. Heritage, we need to think about heritage that can engage as well as be engaged with as a socially situated heritage with agency that can transform the world. And I think we need to look at these relationships dynamically. So it's not a case of, or just a case of how do we protect heritage, but we have to think about how can processual notions of heritage contribute to peace building? How can a processual understanding of heritage help in the face of climate change? So there's a, a need to do heritage differently. And therefore, I have this call for a transformation uh, buying into some shifts in other disciplines that I'm aware of, uh, shifting from critical heritage towards Pacific heritage. That's heritage based upon ideas of peace rather than a great big ocean. Uh, so what do we do now? Uh, I think partly we should be reflecting upon the consequences of processual thinking. As Kelly said, terms really matter. The everyday use of language really does matter. But we need to make space for evolution, for change and for ongoing dialogue. A living heritage is something that is, quote, 
a, a description of a, night, of a tree that I read at the weekend, actually, something that is both alive to the light of each passing second, but also containing a capacity for a profound story of, lived, of a lived past. I think there's a require, this requires in, innovative governance, creative practice. I mean, Jim Perry has talked a lot about adaptive heritage practices, uh, requires a lot of transparency and increased accountability. I think perhaps a, a pluriversalist perspective is something I've been really interested in in recent years, a more nuanced attitude towards issues of top down and bottom up scholarship and practice, nature and culture, such divides are always artificial anyway. And I think this is a prompt for activism and social justice, a heritage that is politically situated and motivated. We can see this again and again today in the, and connected with issues about climate crisis or Black Lives Matter, for instance. Some people like to see a stable heritage that is fossilized, packaged, possessed, uh, kept free from trespass. But I feel that a heritage which is alive is both more sustainable, but also more socially embedded and just. And as a final word, we need humility, but we should not be meek. I think violence and inequality are not inherent. Negative peace is not an achievement. Building a concrete wall around a World Heritage Site to protect it from the rising sea levels is not a sustainable solution. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Harvey, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, quite insightful. Uh, now, what we really have to bring out from this session and what we really truly needed to understand is the diverse links between culture, environment, peace and resilience, because these links are the ones which is the key to future action. So before we move to Kelly's question, I would like to ask all the panelists, what do you see as the needed steps, the next steps, our action to future, our uh, vision for the future uh, to connect culture, climate and peace? Uh, we can start with uh, Mr. David. Thank you, uh, put on the spot. I was, <laughs> um, I was thinking out as, 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 as I said earlier, I was watching everyone else. And so I had a chance to sort of reflect and think about some of these things. And I, I guess it's, there's a couple of points. I mean, particularly Kelly brought this out. I mentioned it in my talk about how, how terms matter and we've got to be really careful about using terms. And I think this, to take this forward is be always really careful about using these terms, whether it's thinking about culture, nature that Kelly so ably talked about and others, but also, you know, and they're sort of trying to rethink those dualisms in a, in a not, and not just take the, implicitly take things for granted. Uh, and there's a word that comes to my mind. I was watch, watching the introductions earlier, but also ourselves, each other talking here, which a lot of people throw out without sometimes too much thinking. And that, I guess, is community. Um, and uh, is it the other C word? We've got the climate change, we've got the culture, and the community, which, you know, what is, what's meant by this word community, and to think about how, uh, how we can complicate it, perhaps, uh, thinking, you know, why is it always singular often, the community or the community approach? Can it include non-humans or more than humans? I think it should. Uh, and, and, re and, 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 but just there's a sort of implicit assumptions that people invoke when they use that word. And I think it behoves all of us to really reflect upon that as my own, that's my own, I suppose, critical self-commentary really, but thinking about the day more broadly. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Kelly, do you have any insights on the same? And then we can move to your question as well. You can pose it at the end. Uh, yes, thank you, that would be great. Uh, I would really just like to echo what David was saying about uh, the power of language and not in the sense of, I mean, language is always important for communication, but it's the power of language is really when people aren't able to understand each other. It's still about communication, but hearing from the other presenters about efforts to really make it clear to governments that heritage is so important in climate action efforts, but it's really about how do you get across that heritage has an important role to play and that peace is crucial. Um, and I think it's really lovely that Prana came to talk about the Anthropocene because I think it's, for many, it's a very new term. And I really am looking forward to seeing how it, becomes more common and how it also takes on more power perhaps uh, uh, about how the human is because it's uh, from what I understand it's supposed to reflect 
that we have made this environment. It's the, the era, you know, made by humans. And that also gives all the responsibility back to us to change things. Wonderful. And would you like to ask your question then to Ms. Prerna, Yohe, and Christine? Yes. So my question, maybe if I can reword it slightly, mm -hmm. um, not a mental model, but maybe what is really needed for you in your, for Prerna, Yohe, and um, Christine, Christine in your work with for from what I understand is a lot of on the ground work trying to convince people of the, the importance of your efforts. What do people not understand when you're trying to communicate how important your projects are? We can start with Christine. Um, what I found uh, interesting is this the link that is it's this direct link that exists between climate and all the other elements with uh, culture and peace, but also with nature, with all the population, the development of, it, of, the, of the country, its economy, its heritage. But uh, I, I think that, that no new plan or recovery plan or new project should be held while ignoring all the elements of climate change. But instead, uh, every new plan should be held in parallel with the green one, with the green project, with uh, including uh, sustainable solutions to all the to to all the elements that uh, the climate change is uh, uh, is uh, is putting uh, uh, to challenge. So. Uh, so that's what I think, and and uh, we are here today, and we uh, these all these studies and these uh, case studies help us to uh, to raise, uh, if we want to to say it like that, to raise awareness of the greatest risks that are threatening, uh, that is threatening at all levels, and. Uh, but also it should be an opportunity to help uh, to prevent uh, more damage uh, and limit damage, the, the damage that is already happening. So, uh, so that's it. Great. Uh, Ms. Prerna, would you like to go next? Yeah, thank you, Chewy. Uh, and it was a wonderful session. Thank you all the speakers uh, for those uh, varying insights. Uh, the biggest challenge we face is uh, trying to convince people how our past is, is important if we have to devise solutions for the future. Uh, well, many uh, consider that future is in new hands in a new generation, and why do we need to uh, invest energy into securing things that are no longer going to serve us? So this intangible nature of heritage has to be communicated, and uh, as others uh, uh, demonstrated that the language is very important, the narrative, the education perspective that we build around it is necessary so that they understand the relevance of it and, uh, uh, and they uh, take an approach uh, which is not stereotypical but innovative in how they engage with it, like live heritage uh, example shared. Like it doesn't have to be in a museum setting, it could be in a public setting and openly accessible and uh, where people are feel, uh, feel free to engage and uh, draw experiences from it. Great. Uh, we are quite close to, we've been reminded that the next session has uh, started. So Mr. Yohei, let's have your insight and we will shortly wrap this session up and we will all move on to the next one. Mr. Yohei, what is, uh, how do you feel about this? Uh, thank you very much, Yui. And uh, so thank you for giving me uh, such a nice uh, occasion to speak out about the Japanese system. And uh, also, so I'm very uh, emphasized uh, that the, the community involvement is uh, very important uh, for the climate change and also the uh, culture and the peace. And uh, so I think uh, the such a traditional system and uh, to hear the voice of land, including the uh, many uh, things, uh, is a very important uh, to think about the future. So thank you very much for <laughs> uh, such occasion. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Yohei. I would like to take this opportunity 
to ask all of our participants. If you have any questions, please write them on the chat and we will record them and try to get them uh, get back to you as soon as possible. Our next session on the culture, the missing link has already started. Please find the Zoom link to join right in your chat, uh, right there. And uh, we are very happy. We would like to thank all of our panelists for their time for this wonderful Ignite talk. I would also like to invite our speakers, panelists, and participants to be a part of our climate open mic, which is going to happen at 5 p.m. Rome time. Uh, this is a place where you can have your open space and informal discussion about all the interesting topics that we have covered here. And see you all in the next session.